well, I hope everybody's signed in. Um, thank you all for coming this morning. We really appreciate having these face-to-face -face opportunities, so we're glad we're, you're all here. And many thanks to the, um, the John William Armstrong Jr. Endowment in Communications for making these lectures possible, making us uh, able to more today to come and, and talk with us. And the Spring 23 Armstrong Lecture, as I just said, is going to be delivered by renowned um, sports journalist and author, Karen Smore. Um, he has covered the Super Bowl, the World Series, NBA championships, and major golf tournaments. Um, he fits the bill as a consummate professional um, he's interacting with our students in ways that he's mentoring them, and they already have careers in journalists, as journalists in their own right. Um, he was honored by the National Association of Black Journalists for being the longest running black sports um, columnist in the history of major newspapers. His resume is miles and miles long. Um, and um, he's giving me street cred. <laughs> I, I appreciate that if my family members and um, fan, sports fan, faculty members that are like, you have to talk to Timor. I want to take a class with Timor. How can I do that? <laughs> um, so I appreciate that on a personal note. Um, and he will be talking to us today about his book, Another Atlanta Legend, The Real Hank Aaron, An Intimate Look at the Life and Legacy of the Home Run King. So please welcome journalists. Yeah, you know, I like that introduction, and I didn't even write it. I mean, that's, that, that's very impressive. I, I like that. Uh, this is my first semester teaching at uh, Georgia State, and I absolutely love it. And, and, and I say this because prior to Georgia State, I taught seven years at Miami University. That's in Oxford, Ohio. That, that's my alma mater. And so I didn't know what to expect. As a matter of fact, it's also an alma mater of Dr. Atkinson there, too. Okay? Yay! So... But uh, the faculty has been great. The students have been fantastic. <clears throat> so it's just been a, a great, fantastic, fabulous, wonderful, whatever adjective I can name, experience. Although I tell my students to stay away from adjectives and adverbs, but that's another story. Uh, <clears throat> so what I want to do today, I want to do basically four buckets of things. Uh, the first bucket is I'm going to tell you an, an anecdote. And that's what I talk to my students all about, about anecdotes rock. Anecdote about me and Hank Aaron. And then I'm going to give you an overview of what this book is all about. And then I'm going to tell you how the book came about. Then we'll open up for questions. Now, the running theme through all this I want you to pay attention to is journalism. Okay? Because there's a, a, that theme is there. And, and, and that and also what I would call fate. Being a spiritual person, I believe that nothing is by coincidence. And when you hear this story, you're going to see how everything ties in together. And, the, you know, people, mentees of mine and students of mine, they, they hear common themes all the time from me. And one of the common themes I always tell my students and my mentees is everything's the same. Okay? So I'm teaching something here. So keep all that in mind as I tell you this entire uh, story, the sequence, this, this tale, because <clears throat> it's rather fascinating. Uh, let's start with anecdotes. This goes back to the spring of 2014. In the spring of 2014, this was the 40th anniversary of Hank Aaron breaking Babe Ruth's all-time home run record. Anybody hear of Babe Ruth? Besides people who are old as me? Okay, very good. Babe Ruth was considered the great white hope. Okay? He, uh, he, baseball was king back in the 1920s and 30s and 40s, and actually all the way up to the 60s. So Babe Ruth was considered the guy, and he had an all-time hits record, 714, which people thought no one could ever break. So then we get to April 8, 1974, Atlanta Fulton County Stadium, Hank Aaron, Henry Aaron. He breaks the record, his number 715, all right? And it was not a pretty sight. By the way, was anybody there on April 8, 1974, when he, when he broke the record? Usually when I, when, I, when I say that, somebody says, oh, I was there. They're, they're lying. 
But they said, I was there, you know. I was there. I mean, there were like 55,000 people that were actually there. But as time goes on, it's like a million people saw this, this event. So the 40th anniversary, the spring of 2014. And at the time, I was also working for CNN. So I called up Hank, and I said, I said, Hank, and, and by the way, I got to set this up. As personable as Hank was, he really did not like to do interviews. He did very few interviews, okay? And the person he did the most interviews with was with me, which is why I called myself in the book the Hank Aaron Whisperer, because whenever Hank wanted something out there, he would call me. So I was the main guy that he would, would, would talk to. So I kind of figured he would say yes. So I called him. I said, hey, Hank, this is the 40th anniversary. You're breaking uh, Babe Ruth's record. I said that, uh, would you agree to do this CNN interview, you know, the sit-down interview? I said, sure, that's, that's fine. I was like, okay, this is great. So I called CNN, CNN and they're all excited, like, okay, let's, let's do this thing. So <clears throat> it was like about a few days later, and I'm sitting in my house, okay, and I remember this like it was yesterday. And I'm watching the, the local news, probably Channel 2, so I work for Channel 2, and uh, there's this bulletin. It says that uh, breaking news, uh, home, uh, baseball legend Henry Aaron. Now, when it starts off like that, what do you think? Right, right. I'm like, oh my gosh, Hank is dead. <laughs> so so then, then it says, uh, had an accident and he, he slipped on some ice had to, in his driveway and, uh, and, and he, he fractured his hip. Now, <clears throat> I don't know if anybody in here, I'm gonna ask the younger people here. The, the, the younger folks here, that's people younger than me, okay. Uh, have you ever had a relative or a friend who's like 80 years old break their hip? What, what, what normally happens with that? They do that, and then sometimes they don't make it. That's not a good thing when, when an elderly person breaks their hip. So I'm just thinking, oh, this is, this is really bad. So a few days, and, and then, then I'm thinking, well, there goes that interview. So uh, but that was secondary, of course. I guess. So a few days go by, and I call up Billy, and Billy is his, his, his widow now, great lady. And Billy, I said, I said, Billy, how bad is it? She said, it's pretty bad. And I was like, oh, man, this is not good. So I called Hank a few days later and to see how he was doing. And he didn't really feel like talking that much, which I could understand. And then uh, he said, but he said, I'll tell you what. He said, if, if I feel up to doing the interview at some point, again, uh, this is 2014, April uh, uh, 8th is the anniversary, but you know, you can do it any time in that window for CNN, whatever. He said, if I fill up to it, I'll, I'll give you a call. I said, okay, fine, thinking that this interview is never going to happen. Remember that theme, this interview is never going to happen. So uh, it's about a month or so later, the phone rings, sitting at my home in, in Smyrna, and it's, it, it's pouring down rain. And it was just, it's just a downpour. And I pick up the phone, and it's Hank Aaron. I said, hey, how's it going, Hank? He said, pretty good. He said, listen. listen. He said, uh, I'm ready to do that interview. I said, oh, okay. I said, when do you want to do it? He said, now. Now? <laughs> he said, I'm feeling pretty good right now. He said, I only got about maybe an hour window before the, the med medication <laughs> sets in. He said, we need to do it now. I said, uh, okay. I said, well, it's Hank Aaron. Hank Aaron wants to do an interview now. We'll do it now. So I said, okay. So I hang up the phone. I call CNN. And I said, listen, Hank wants to do an interview now, blah, blah, blah. And they're great. Okay, my producer, he said, okay, we're, we're on it. He said, just sit tight. A few minutes later, he calls me back. And he said, listen, he said, we got a window about an hour and a half. He said, we got this camera crew that's going to Afghanistan, okay? But they can stop by the rehab center and, and knock off this thing with Hank. We got to do it within the next hour, next hour and a half. I said, okay, good, good. So I called back Hank. I said, hey, Hank, I think we're, we're good for this. He said, okay. So, so then I call the rehab center, and I said, is there a place where we can set up to do this interview. And the ladies all said, oh yeah, great, we, you can use the rec room, the rec, rec room and everything is great. Now, as I tell this story, okay, for the journalism students, I want you to get the big picture out of this, okay? The big picture, because what you're gonna see in this big picture is tips on reporting, okay? I see one of my students, Evan, is in here, right? And Evan, we always talk about tips, right? Different tips, okay? And this is a tip on reporting. And I always say, look at the big picture. Look at the elephant and not the rabbit, because if you concentrate on the rabbit, you're gonna get trampled by the elef elephant, right? So we're gonna look at the elephant here, okay? So, so anyway, so it's like, okay, this is great. So I, I call, they got, got the room all set up. So I call CNN, I said, okay, you can come to this uh, rec center, uh, the, the, this rehab center. They got this rec center all set up and we're all, we're all good. 
So now I'm getting ready to go take a shower, and the phone rings. Pick up the phone. It's this rehab center. And it's another lady. She says, yeah, they just told me that you want to do something with Hank Aaron, blah, blah, blah. We can't do it here. I said, oh, really? I said, what? Well, yeah, because of legal reasons. You can't film here, blah, blah, blah. Pouring down rain. I'm thinking, oh, this is, well, there goes that. Okay. End of interview. Number two, or whatever number that is. That, that's, that's over with. So I call CNN, and I tell them, we can't do this because the this, this situation with the rehab center. And the producer, great again, said, sit tight. I'm on this. Calls me back in about three minutes. He said, you know, we found out we're, we're near the rehab center, there's this, uh, this golf club, okay? So we can do the interview there. Can you get Hank from the rehab center to the golf club in like 35 minutes? And I was like, oh, yeah, I can do that. It's like, oh, yeah, right, sure, I can do that. Okay, yeah, yeah, we'll get this done. <laughs> so, so I hang up the phone, and uh, I call up Hank. I say, hey, Hank, I'll be there in about 25 minutes. And, and I'm talking a mile a minute, and I'm telling him about the situation. We got to go to, the, uh, to this golf club, blah, blah, blah. And there's like this pause on the phone. And, and again, I'm thinking, is he dead? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and I said, hey, Hank. He says, uh... He says, I don't think I can do it. Okay, there goes the interview again. And then I said, okay. I said, okay. He says, um, you're not feeling good? He said, no. I said, I feel okay. He says, I just don't have anything to wear. Aww. So then I said, I, I can get you something. Okay? And I'm thinking to myself, where the fuck get this stuff? Then I remember my parents had just visited about a, a month before. They came down and visited quite often. And my dad was about the same size as Hank Aaron. So I said, I, I got some stuff that I can bring, you know, my dad and blah, blah, blah. I'm just talking off the top of my head. I said, I don't know how this is going to work out. And then Hank just says, okay. I said, <laughs> so I'm getting a duffel bag, and I'm just like throwing stuff in the duffel bag, you know, and it's still pouring down rain and everything. And I call CNN, and they're, they're all excited. Said, okay, okay. He said, but, you know, we've got this, this tight uh, you know, space that we've got to do all this, all this in. I said, okay, I'm, I'm, that's fine. So I'm driving through the rain. I get to this rehab center, get out of the car. And I'm just like rushing and get the duffel bag and, and I walk inside and then it just occurred to me when I started looking around. This is not a rehab center. This is a nursing home. Okay? You guys have been to nursing homes before. And I've got have a, I have a lot of older relatives, so I've been to a lot of nursing homes. I was like, I thought this was supposed to be a rehab center. <laughs> this is a nursing home. And I'm like walking down the hall and I'm just looking at these people and it's like, Hank's in, Hank's in the, he's in a nursing home. You know, and I get to the room where, where Hank is, and Hank is sitting on the side of the bed looking very comfortable. Like he's about to get on these, these, these covers, you know, in a nice little fluffy pillow. He doesn't look ready for a CNN interview. <laughs> so I'm like thinking, okay, there goes the interview again. And uh, so I said, so Hank, uh, how's it going? <laughs> Pretty good. He said, are we going to go? I said, yeah. So I've got stuff in the duffel bag, and I'm taking it out. So I'm sitting there helping him get dressed. I'm thinking to myself, this is crazy. I, I am dressing the greatest baseball player of all time, okay, in a nursing home, sitting on the side of the bed, you know. And then a nurse comes in, and she helps me kind of finish the process. So I get him into a wheelchair. Okay, and that was a surrealistic experience, too. So I'm pushing Hank Aaron down the hallway in a wheelchair, you know, in this nursing home with people, hey, Hank, you know, waving at him, stuff like that. Again, Hank looking very much like he wants to go turn around and go back and get in that bed, okay? <laughs> so I'm pushing him out there, and, and seeing this got a car waiting, waiting, and my cell phone is ringing off the hook, you know? It's just like uh, kids, you know, when you're in the, in the car, you know, with the parents, when you're like 10 years old, are we there yet? They're like, are you here yet? We got to, uh, it's like, leave me alone. I'm doing the best I can. That's what I'm thinking of myself. So I just stopped answering the phone at this point. So I get him out to the, uh, to the, uh, to the curb, and they had a car waiting for us, still pouring down rain, and, and it's just the ordeal just getting him in this huge SUV. And then, uh, you know, and the, and the guy that's driving the SUV is starstruck. He's like a, a black guy, say about 40 years old, and he's just talking, oh, Hank, you know, you're my favorite player, blah, 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 so on, so forth. And I'm thinking to myself, man, get to this place. I don't care about this. And, and Hank being Hank, very accommodating, you know, he's, he's talking, you know, like, He's trying to be accommodating, but I could tell he's hurting, okay? And I'm trying to save as much energy for Hank Aaron for this interview without him talking to this fan about, you know, what happened in 1968 in, in uh, Cincinnati, okay? So we get to the place, get him out of the car, 
And as soon as we get into the, to the golf place, this little country club type area, it's like half of Atlanta is in there, okay, including half of CNN. And I'm like, we don't need this. Hank, you know, could, could you sign this? Could, uh, and I, I got to play in, in force. No, he's not signing anything. <laughs> you know, we got to do this interview, okay? So we get up to the ballroom where this interview is going to take place, and I'm thinking that these guys are going to be frantic from CNN. Some of them were, but the, the, ones that were, the ones that weren't frantic, guess what they were asking for? Right. Yeah. Hank, could you do this? But I'm like, oh, man, this is nuts. Okay. So we get Hank, and so they had the setting there. They had a, a chair here and a chair here. Okay, one for Hank, one for me. And, it's, and this time it's getting frantic because Afghanistan is calling for these cameramen. They got to get going, okay? <laughs> so they put Hank in this chair. They put me in, in this chair here, and they got the makeup lady going, putting the makeup on us and stuff like that. And uh, we're just getting ready to roll. And then something occurred to me. Something occurred to me. What do you think I forgot to do up to this point? Yeah. There you go. One of the things. Evan, we always talk about what? Have a what? My See, he wasn't in class that day. <laughs> we, talk, we talk about having a game plan, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Every time. There you go. You, got to, you, got to, you have to have a game plan. You know, I have got no game plan. I'm sitting here. I'm going to go on national television with his exclusive interview for Hank Aaron, I've got nothing, okay? So, so I looked at the producer, I said, hey, listen, I said, I didn't have time to prepare, and to do something else I tell, tell my students too, is people don't care about the excuses, okay? When you turn on CNN and see an interview with Hank Aaron, you just wanna see that interview. You don't care about all this other stuff, okay? But I'm, <laughs> I'm sitting there with my producer, I don't have time to prepare, you know, the dog ate my homework. I mean, can, can you give me 10 minutes to prepare? And the guy looked at me and says, you got five. So I get up, I go in the restroom, I'm just jotting down some, some key questions. And again, this is where the learning thing comes in, where I tell the students. We talked about the last week about tips on interviewing, okay? So, so I'm, I'm using everything, I'm, I'm practicing what I preach about interviewing techniques, about, uh, about making eye contact, about being prepared, about uh, making your, your, the person you're interviewing feel comfortable, okay? And, and, I, and let me dive, go backwards a little bit. When I originally set up this interview and I was getting ready to go out to do the interview, I was kind of dressed like this, you know, and of course in those days you, you wore dress shoes, but now they just don't have to do that. At least I don't. And then, so, I'm like that. but then when I found out that Hank didn't have anything to wear, okay, and I started throwing in stuff in this bag, it's like, I can't dress like this. I got to dress like Hank's going to dress, okay? And for the students, why is that important for me to dress like Hank Aaron during this interview? Because he feels more comfortable, right? I mean, if, he's wearing a, if I'm wearing a suit and he's not wearing a suit, that gives you a whole different feel. Okay, so I got to dress like that. So I'm, I'm thinking about dressing like that. So now I get back from make, doing these questions. I'm sitting here, Hank's sitting there, and I look across about, from Hank, and it is a miracle. Because Hank Aaron looks like he's like 40 years old, getting ready to do some sprints. And I said, how did this happen? He just looks nothing like the guy that was on the side of the bed. It was like, it was, it was, it was a miracle. It was miraculous, okay? So would you like to see how that turned out? It was actually a three-part thing, okay? But I'm just going to show you part one, about five minutes. And then on the back side of this, I got questions for you. No, not really. I will continue with the story here. But let, let's, see, let's see how this turned out. This is going to be five minutes of this interview. You know, I always thought it was ironic that on April 15, 1947, Jackie Robinson breaks the color barrier. You hit that home run to top Babe Ruth on April 8, 1974. That's like 27 years almost to the date. And he was your hero. And, and, and I always was fascinated by that story you told me about when you first saw Jackie Robinson when you were a kid. Well, of course, back then, I, I was my, my, my mother. My parents expected me to go to school, and I, I had read about where Jackie and the Dodgers were going to play an exhibition game in Mobile. And Jackie was speaking, I believe, at a drugstore. And I said, now, nah, I'm not going to have this opportunity again. So I said, I better take my chance on listening to Jackie Robinson now. And little did I know that I got front row seat. Oh, wow. But listen to this. 
next to me on the front row was my father. Oh, man. <laughs> but it was worth it. Yeah. <laughs> and I, yeah. need, I don't need to tell you what happened after. <laughs> so, <laughs> wow. But, but it was worth it, though, really. But he was, he was my hero, always have been. And not only for, for what the, the baseball that he played, but simply because of the person he was. Now, after that, did you, did you guys encounter each other through the years, either when he was playing or, in, or afterwards? When I signed my contract with the Boston Braves, that I was able to play exhibition games against the Dodgers. And who do I play against but Jackie Robinson, who played maybe eight, nine, ten exhibition games against each other. And it was, uh, let me say, it was a thrill. I mean, he was a guy that was sort of the social conscious of baseball and after he died, I know that affected you a lot, where you kind of felt like you had to be the next Jackie Robinson. It did. It did affect me. And, and in fact, um, th there was no improvement as far as minorities in baseball other than on the playing field. Right. And he wanted to see minorities even elevated, not only on the playing field, but also in the front office. He felt like one step at a time, which we always talk about, and we had gotten to the point where we were, had showed everybody that we could play the game of baseball. So he was telling everybody, said, just give us a chance now to be coaches and instructors and people that we can do in the front office. I've always admired you from this standpoint, even back then, Willie Mays, Ernie Banks. You had these prominent black players at the time who could have come up and stepped up and did something and, and, and been, been outspoken about things that were going on. You were the only one. Did, did you feel sort of lonely being out there sort of by yourself? Well, yes, I did in some ways. But then I, then I thought that, you know, if you're not going to do it right, then don't do it at all. You know, um, I, I realized that the people that you just mentioned had other things. They, their, their agenda was made up of other things. You know, leading up to April 8th, 1974, when you broke Babe Ruth's record, and it's just amazing to me how you were able to hit a baseball consistently with all that stuff whirling around you, mm -hmm. with the hate mail and the, and the evilness just that you experience all the time. How did you mentally, physically, and spiritually get yourself ready every game to go out there and play despite all that stuff that's around you? In spite of all of the things that I went through, and you mentioned some of them, um, I've always been able to separate the two. I always felt like once I got my, once, once I put the uniform on and once I got on the playing field, that I could separate the two from saying an evil letter I got the day before or even 20 minutes before, that I could also concentrate on what I had to do as far as trying to watch a fastball or somebody throwing a ball 90 miles an hour rather than worrying about a letter that somebody sent. But do, do you ever wonder sometime how much or how much you, how, how, what you would have done without all that stuff? Could you hit like 900 home runs instead of the 755? Now that that is one thing I often think about. I, you know, nobody ever asks the question. If I had had the means, if somebody had said, "Oh, Hank, come on, you know, let's go out and have dinner tonight," rather than worrying about yeah. slipping out of the back doors of ballparks or staying in a hotel that uh, your ball players or your teammates were not there. Uh, I don't know what I would have done. Unless you've been stranded on a desert or in a boat without communications for the past 20 hours, you're bound to know that George Herman Ruth ceased to be the greatest home run hitter at about 9 p.m. last night. For 44 on the hammer, and he hit. Well, Let's go back to that day, April 8th. It's such a fascinating day. You hit the home run. Okay, and, it's, and it's going toward left center field, Atlanta Fulton County Stadium. Al Downing is a pitcher. Mm -hmm. you're, you're running toward first base. Let's just stop right there. What are you thinking about when you're going to first base? Not much of anything. I, I think when I touched first base and when I got almost to second base, I started thinking about, I started thinking about isn't this wonderful that here I am, the third oldest child of Estella and Herbert Aaron, and the two of them is sitting in the stands watching me, their son, play professional baseball. Isn't it wonderful that they could be here on this day to witness history? And I tell you, to this day, I don't know how, how she managed to do it. She got 
to home plate quicker than I got to home plate. <laughs> That's a great scene. And, and she was just, the tears are flowing. Yes, and, and, uh, yes. What was said during that moment when you're at home plate and she's there hugging you? And I, I don't think was much was said because she was choking me so much. <laughs> I, I don't think I, I could say much, you know, really. When you're running around the bases, I never will forget this. You hear that bang, bang. What were you thinking? There were fireworks. Were you thinking something else? No, not really. I, I wasn't thinking much of anything. You know, a, a good friend, and speaking about that, a very good friend of mine, is, um, he was on the police department at that time. I don't know whether you noticed, but in a picture that you see, you see him had a little briefcase, had a little thing around his neck. I've seen that, yes. And inside that little thing, it was a snub nose 32. Oh, and he goodness. told me, he said, Hank, he said, I just didn't know what to do. <laughs> When you start running around the bases, those two guys started running behind you. I said, I'm glad you didn't shoot. Because they would, they would have it. Those two guys were having nothing oh, but just fun. Man. That's all. And I can remember very clearly that Monday, the day that you hit the home run, mm -hmm. uh, the parents and the two brothers and I gathered around the television set. It was very similar. It had to be to where perhaps you and others back on April 15, 1947, gathered around the radio for Jackie Robinson. I mean, you were our Jackie Robinson. Mm -hmm. Did you sense, uh, get the sensation of, of how important you were to the black uh, community with what you were doing, what you were going through? Yes, I did. In some ways, I, I felt the importance of what I was doing was really signal, was sending a signal to the world, was telling people that, hey, yeah, all you wanted to do was have the playing field level. Just give me an opportunity. Yes, I felt that way. I felt that way that not only that I had a, I, I had the world on my shoulders as far as baseball was concerned, but I also had the world on my shoulders to demonstrate to people that, hey, just give me an opportunity. But at that same time, you know, if you think about it, you know, Dr. King was marching and the civil rights was at its peak, you know, and we were telling people just, give us a chance to drink water out of a fountain right, right, right. or go to the bathroom or go to the, anywhere, you know, really. And that, all of those things had something to do with the, the way I was doing as far as playing baseball. Okay, so this is gonna bring us right to the book, The, the Real Hank Aaron. And I'm gonna talk about kind of like the overwhelming uh, theme in this book. And the theme talks about the symmetry between Jackie Robinson, Hank Aaron, and myself, okay? And I'm going to break that down. You guys know who Jackie Robinson was, right? Jackie Robinson was one of the most instrumental persons in the history of America, more than what people say he was instrumental for. Everybody wants to concentrate on April 15, 1947. That was very minor, okay? He was, Jackie Robinson, very much a huge part of the civil rights movement. And it, he was more bigger than after baseball than he was during baseball. Hank saw that from the very beginning. That's why Hank idolized him. He didn't, he didn't idolize the baseball part. He, he idolized the other part about Jackie Robinson. And Jackie Robinson was, was uh, fabulous. He, this is actually was the 70, this is the 75th, or last year was the 75th anniversary of Jackie Robinson breaking the color barrier, okay? Doesn't give us due. Uh, you got the Hank Aaron part. Hank Aaron, I'm gonna elaborate on this, uh, what you just heard there. Hank Aaron, when Jackie Robinson died on, in October of 1972, they're at the funeral in New York, and you had Ernie Banks and Willie Mays. And for those of you who don't know, Ernie Banks and Willie Mays were prominent African-American players of all time, certainly back in the 60s and the 70s. And uh, so when Jackie died, <clears throat> they're all at the funeral, and that's when Hank pulled them aside and said, look, now that Jackie has died, it's up to us to carry on the, on the, the mantle. And they both looked at him like, you know, he had two heads, like, you got to be crazy. Because they didn't want that to affect their image, okay? And Hank told me, I'm the one that broke the story at the time, Hank told me, he said, I told them, you know what, I'll do it myself. Which tells you an awful lot about Hank Aaron. So you got the Jackie Robinson thing, you got the Hank Aaron thing, and then you have me as a trailblazing black sports journalist. And I'm going to give you a, a brief history about me along those lines. Uh, and why, and this story is going to tell you, in large part, why Hank and I connected so well. Because Hank saw my story, and he could relate to it, and he could see that I related to him through this story. Um, I grew up in a family of Jackie Robinsons. And uh, I was born and raised in, in, in the early years 
in a place called South Bend, Indiana. Little, little university in South Bend. Anybody know what university that is? Yeah, University of Notre Dame. <coughs> yeah. And so we lived about two punts away from the Golden Dome. So I grew up as a diehard Notre Dame fan. And my dad uh, was the uh, uh, first black person in the history of South Bend, Indiana, to work in uh, an Indiana Bell. That was a telephone company back then. And he started out as a janitor in the early 50s. And every time he tried to work his way up, he would get shot down. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. My dad went from being uh, a janitor at, at Indiana Bell, first black person in the history of the building to work there, to being the first black supervisor in the history of AT&T in the 60s, and became one of the first two or three black managers in the history of AT&T. It goes back to the early 50s. So every time he got shot down, he just he tried harder. He used to study these, bo these books on, uh, on electronic engineering all the time. And, and that kind of helped him break through the door. And uh, when he was training, we were living in South Bend at the time. When he was training, he, they would fly him to Cincinnati for these meetings. And uh, he would tell us these stories. And that's, that's one of the great things about my, my parents. They used to tell us all these stories that helped us through the years to deal with racism. Okay, better than probably any black people on the face of the earth. I, I will flat out say that. I think I'm, there's nobody who's more prepared than us than, than we were because of our parents. One of the incidents my dad uh, told us about took place on November 22nd, 1963. Anybody knows what, what happened on that date? Kennedy. Right, Kennedy's assassination. Okay, so my dad tells a story. They're in Cincinnati, they're at this meeting, you know, for people training to be supervisors. And he's the only black person in the room, packed room like this, Cincinnati. And uh, uh, he says that a guy comes in and says that, got news from Dallas, Texas, that uh, President Kennedy was shot and killed. My dad said everybody in the room started cheering. And then they looked at him for a reaction. And for those who, who are not familiar with the history, uh, JFK had the reputation of being pro-African American. Okay? And a lot of people didn't like that. And there's some speculation. I'm a big JFK assassination buff, so I can go on and on, so I better cut it off. <laughs> but anyway, I'll, I'll just get to the point. So, uh, so, I mean, they looked at him, like, what kind of reaction is he going to get? And my dad said he gave them no reaction. Why do you think dad gave them no reaction? Because that's the best reaction. There you go. They wanted a reaction. There you go. They wanted a reaction. He gave them no reaction. So there's a little kid, he's telling these, these stories, and these stories are, like, sinking in. Okay? And there's all other kind of stories. I'll just give you that, that big one right there. So then my mom, my mom, she uh, was the first black employee at this place called The Associates. It was a savings and loan company that was based in South Bend, Indiana, okay? And uh, she, the only, only job they would give her was custodian, okay, which was way beneath what she could do, but she just wanted to get her foot in the door. And every time she would, and she's got rejection letters <laughs> to this day. My mom's 87, lives in Cincinnati, sharp as a whip. <laughs> And she just tells these stories like they happened yesterday. You know, she just kept trying and trying and trying. So finally, she worked her way up to be like a filing clerk, okay, at the, at the associates. But there's a, there's a part two of that story here in a minute. So my dad gets transferred by AT&T across the Midwest. So there was a stretch where, and I've got two brothers, I'm the oldest. There's a stretch where we uh, lived, where I went to three different high schools in three different states in three different years. So he got transferred from South Bend to Cincinnati in 68. Chicago in 71, and then to Milwaukee in 72. And all the times we were transferred, my parents always tried to get us in the best school district, which generally was a predominantly white school district. And it was hell. <laughs> we talk about the 60s and the 70s. But everything's meant for a reason. It was all preparing us for a purpose, okay, about how to handle different things. Uh, just jumping ahead, my brother Daryl, my youngest brother Daryl, he was the first uh, black baseball player in the history of University, University of Wisconsin. That was in 1977. And he's got horrific stories about that, particularly when they would play in the South, about the things that would take place, okay? Uh, when we moved to Cincinnati, my mom uh, still worked for Associates, and uh, she was put in charge, broke through, she was in charge of all the cashiers at this, this, this place. And she always talked about this, this lady named Martha, uh, who was a terrorist in her life, okay, and just hated my mom because she was younger and because she was black, basically. And uh, one of the biggest stories that my mom would tell is about one day Martha came in 
and, and, and she always talked about how Martha always had this plastic smile, okay? I came up with her and had these keys and dangled the keys in my mom's face and said that, you see these keys right here? I can get into your drawers anytime I want and just walk away. So when, when my mom would go tell the boss about it, what do you think the boss would say? Oh, that's not happening. Or, oh, well, she, she's just kidding, okay? She's just having fun, okay, that, that kind of stuff. So this, this is the household I grew up in. Uh, then me personally, uh, I was a first in a lot of things, even growing up. I was a first, I was an athlete, and, and I was just telling my students yesterday that I was kind of a weird high school guy because I was a combination, I was a great athlete, but I also was a nerd. I, I didn't like hanging out with the athletes because they were like boring to me. They were stupid, okay? <laughs> so I mean, if, Evan, what did I say my favorite class was? Physics. Physics. I, I, I like, I like. Yeah, fifth grade, you remember that, the fifth grade teacher. So that, that, that sort of thing. So, but it, it helped me become well-rounded. So I was, in, I was the first black baseball player from my high school in Cincinnati, Chicago, and Milwaukee. First black football player in my, for my team in Milwaukee. And that's interesting because this is the 50th anniversary this fall of us uh, going undefeated and winning the city conference championship. And I was a starting middle linebacker, led the team in tackles. I was pretty good. I was always in the Milwaukee Journal. And here's what's interesting. Not only was I the first black football player, when we won the championship, went undefeated, we still have records in Milwaukee that still have not been broken defensively. We had like four shutouts that year. Not only, not only was I the first black, I was the only black on the team that year, okay? Which brings me to a story which I have in the book. Uh, in the middle of that season, we were going out to play an all-black team. And what happens a lot of times when, and I've got stories throughout my life, and I think some other people can relate to this, what happens throughout time, if you're in a, in a predominantly white setting, a lot of times people forget that you're there. So they start talking like they normally talk, which is not pretty. But for if you're a black person in that situation, if you look at it the right way, it's great. Because number one, you know how they're thinking, and then you know how they react. So this is, this is the first time in my life I'm in this situation. We're getting ready to play an all-black team. The football coach is giving the, the pep rally, you know, hey, we're going to give them that, and all that kind of stuff. And at the end of the pep talk, he says, all right, let's go out there and get those ends. Because he uses the word. Let's go and get those ends. So everybody's running toward the door, and only two guys, not coach, two, two white guys, of course they were white, came back, and they were furious. And they were saying that they were not going to play in the game because of what that coach just said. I said, don't worry about it. Let's forget about it. Let's just go out and play. And they were just, and to this day, they talk about that incident, about what happened. And number two, what also what didn't happen. To this day, I never heard from the head coach or the assistant coach, never apologized, never said a word about it. Just went on a business as usual. So those are the type of things that you, you experience. Uh, I was also the first black person on our high school newspaper. I think it kind of got me somewhere. <laughs> uh, became the first black editor of the high school newspaper. Uh, you're going to see a theme here. I go to Miami, Ohio, okay, which is predominantly white, like 99.9% .9 white. One, one reason I love about Georgia State, too, is that it's so diverse, okay, compared compar to what I'm used to. So Miami, Ohio's got the oldest college newspaper west of the Alleghenies. When I went there in September 1974, I was the first black person ever in the history of the Miami Student Newspaper. I also became the first black editor of any kind for the Miami Student Newspaper. The, the, after my junior year, I got an internship with the Cincinnati Enquirer. I was the first black intern in the history of the Cincinnati Enquirer. I graduated from Miami on May 7, 1978, started working full time there a week later. I was the first black sports writer in the history of the Cincinnati Enquirer. Been around since 1840. I was only the second black person ever to work for the Cincinnati Enquirer. Then in 1980, I get a job at the San Francisco Examiner. Anybody here of uh, William Randolph Hearst? Okay, okay. Uh, Patty Hearst, uh, uh, was it Rose Bl Rosebud, what's the name of that? That, that, that Citizen, Kane. Citizen Kane, yeah, there you go. That, that, we're talking about that guy, okay. I was the first black sports writer in the history of the San Francisco Examiner. Only the third black person ever worked for the San, San Francisco Examiner. Then I come to the Atlanta Journal Constitution in 1985, the first black person, uh, first black sports columnist in the history of the Deep South. 
Somebody tell me the difference between a columnist and a regular writer. What's the, what's the difference? What does, a, what does a columnist do that a regular reporter uh, can't do? Yes. Yeah. Go off your opinion. Okay. So I was hired to write my opinion. And it was holy hell, which is all details in this book. Because, and I'm going to get to that in a minute, uh, I was only the third black sports columnist in the history of major newspapers. First was a guy named Tom Greer from, from uh, in 1976. He lasted six months. Second guy was named Ralph Wiley, Oakland Tribune, that's less than a year. San Francisco Examiner made me sports columnist in 1983. And, and as mentioned before, I'm the longest running black sports columnist in the history of major newspapers. Nobody's ever going to break that record because newspapers, I mean, you young folks don't read newspapers anymore, okay? <laughs> so that record's good. Yeah. So, uh, so anyway, so when I come to Atlanta, and this ties back into this book, I come to Atlanta in 85, the Atlanta Journal Constitution was trying to become uh, the best sports section in the history of mankind, which in many ways they did, okay? They did, just beefed up the sports staff. There was a point in 1991 where we had 50 full-time sports writers, okay? And I used to work at AJT. Did that 50 sport writers in general there now full-time? I don't know, okay? But we had 50 in sports, which is insane, okay? That doesn't include editors or anything like that. So in 85, they had everything but a, bl a black guy, put it bluntly. So what they decided to do was, and, and I found all this stuff later on, so I was in the book, but people told me these things. So they wanted to find, in their mind, the best black writer in the country, okay? So I give them credit for that. <laughs> so San Francisco Examiner. Uh, but they didn't do their research. They thought I was going to be like a black guy writing these little soft feature stories about black people and not saying anything about white folks. But I've, I've written the same way since high school, which is pretty straightforward and, and, and rough, okay? And so when I make a long story short, when I got to the Examiner, uh, the first tactic was to try to get me to change my style. You know, just, you know, small atomic bombs. <laughs> then when they found out I wasn't going to budge, then the next tactic was to try to get me to leave. And that's when it got really ugly, which is all in the book, okay? And the person who helped me through this period was none other than Hank Aaron. Because Hank Aaron saw the similarity. So that, that's involved with what I was going through and what he was going through, and it, it became a, a, a great partnership. It became, became kindred souls, okay? But I'm going to get back to that, but I'm going to go backwards a bit, bit. The first time I met Hank Aaron. This goes back to the spring of 1982, and I'm working at the San Francisco Examiner. And the Examiner was very enlightened management back then. And I look back at that, and that was, that was the greatest time I had in newspapers, by far. I mean, they got it. It was just like old-time newspapers, okay? And uh, in 82, I was covering the San Francisco Giants, continuing the theme. I was only, only the second black person to ever cover a major league baseball team. As a matter of fact, as we stand here right now, I, work, I vote for Baseball Hall of Famers. I'm the longest-running black person ever to vote for Baseball Hall of Famers, only the second one ever to do that. <laughs> and I'm not that old. But anyway, I don't think I'm that old. Uh, so 1982, I'm covering the San Francisco Giants, and I'm getting all these reports where people, people are telling me about how Major League Baseball is phasing out African-American players. I was like, wow. You know, and they're saying that, that, that it's systematic. I'm getting this from prominent players like Joe Morgan, who I knew for years, a Hall of Famer. Frank Robinson, who's the manager of the Giants, prominent Hall of Famer, African-Americans tell me the same thing. I'm like, God, this is, this is fascinating. And, and so I'm, I'm just collecting this stuff. Again, teaching lesson, right? Teaching lesson. So I, I, I'm getting this stuff, but at this time, None of these guys want to, they want to go on the record. And it's strong, but it's still not strong enough, okay? And you don't want to just run out with anything. So I'm still in the collecting stage. Then I get a smoking gun. I get a phone call, and this all happens in a span of like two or three weeks. Spring of 1982, that was the 35th anniversary of Jackie Robinson breaking the color barrier. I get a phone call, and there's a white scout friend of mine, baseball scout, says that, hey, you need to see this. And he said, you're going to be at the game tonight at, in Oakland. And I said, I can be. So I get to the game in Oakland, and, it, and it's like uh, Woodward and Bernstein, Watergate, deep throat. You guys know about that? Okay. 
So he said, he's telling me, okay, meet me in the corner here, but if there's anybody there, then I'm not coming. Okay, but just wait there. I'll wait till somebody's there. So I'm, I'm in the dugout, you know, waiting for this guy, you know, and finally he shows up and everything except like, you know, an overcoat and a big hat. And he's just looking around. He said, so take a look at this. So he gives me this folder, open it up, and, and it's a computerized scouting report, okay? And I'm looking at it, I'm looking at it, I'm looking at it, I'm looking at it. And then I see a slot for race. I said, race? So I look at the guy and said, why is race on the scouting report? He said, you know why race is on the scouting report. I said, wow. So I called the NFL, their scouting report. Do you think they have a slot for race? Nope. NBA? Nope. NHL? Nope. Only Major League Baseball. So I go back and I tell my sports editor this. He says, listen. He says that you're off the Giants beat. He says, take as much time as you can to dig into this and see what you come up with, okay? Jump ahead of the story. It's the best thing I've ever written, okay? It, there's not been anything before or since. They ran over seven days, blockbuster stuff, all on the record. They all said baseball was phasing out African Americans. 1982, the African American population of players was 18%. The people I talked to said that by the turn of the century, it's gonna be low, below 10%. What do you think it is right now? 7%. They were prophetic way back then. I had all this stuff back in 1982, okay? Then when I'm doing this research, I had everybody except for one person, Hank Aaron. Hank Aaron at the time in 82 was the only black executive in baseball. He was only the second in the history of baseball, okay? I had never talked to Hank Aaron before in my life, but here's the thing about Hank Aaron. Growing up as a baseball fan, I had two favorite players. Hank Aaron and Pete Rose. When we moved to Cincinnati in 1980, in 1968, I bought these two posters with, with my, my allowance, okay? Huge posters, one of Pete Rose, one of Hank Aaron, 12 years old. Again, tell me how the story, as so I go from this 12-year-old boy with this Hank Aaron poster to being an honorary pallbearer in his funeral when he died in January 2021. But anyway, so I had, to, I had these posters and, of, of him. So uh, I'm talking, I'm figuring out something. Can I get Hank Aaron? First of all, I'm a little starstruck. And second of all, I mean, how do you get Hank Aaron? Okay, again, teaching lesson here. So I said, I just call, I'll just call him up, see if I can get him on the phone. So I called the Atlanta Braves, I mean, 404-522-7630. The numbers never change, okay? Call, call, call the Braves, and I'm, I'm just like naive. And I, I said that, uh, and they, somebody answers the phone. I said, uh, can you connect me with Hank Aaron's office? He said, sure. And, and this woman answers the phone, her name was Susan Bailey, and jumping ahead of the story, Susan Bailey was Hank Aaron's uh, hatchet woman. Her, uh, her role was to keep people away from Hank Aaron, because Hank wanted that way. Hank was an interesting guy. If you got him, if he came in this room right here and you got him right there, he'd talk to you for hours, okay? But if you never got him, he'd love that too. <laughs> He's like, okay. So, so Susan's role was to say no in polite ways, okay? This tells you how this was meant to be. So I call up, and it's Susan Bailey. I don't, I don't know her from Adam. I said, I said yeah, I said, Terrence Moore, San Francisco Examiner. I said that I'm doing this thing on blacks and baseball and about what's happening with blacks and baseball. I know Hank would, is very close to Jackie Robinson. I wanted to see if he'd be available. She said, hold on. And I, I've told this story through the years, even to Susan Bailey. I said, how'd that happen? She said, I don't know, because normally she'll say no. <laughs> but she said, it was just something about your voice they just convinced me to go ahead and just put you through the Hank. Mm -hmm. So next thing I know, I said, like, hello, and it's Hank. Okay? So I, I'm thinking to myself, remember, this is a teaching lesson. That's what I'm telling you now. So I'm thinking to myself, you know, even though I got him, I better do something real quick so I keep him. So immediately, I said, I said hey, Hank, I said, listen, this is a thrill to talk to you. I just want to tell you that you and I have got something in common. He said, what's that? I said, I love for Jackie Robinson. He said, oh, really? I said, yeah. I said, I come from a Jackie Robinson family. I'm talking a mile a minute because I don't know if he's going to hang up the phone any minute. Okay? So now it's like that movie where I had you at hello. What movie is that? Had you at hello. Or Tom Cruise. Yeah, Tom Cruise. Yeah, it's like that. I had him at Jackie Robinson. <laughs> and the relationship just went on from there. Okay? And so getting to this relationship, and this is what this book is about. It's about... 95% stuff that, that's never been said before about Hank Aaron. And 
changing some of the myths about Hank Aaron. And what I mean by that is, Hank Aaron has got this reputation in some quarters of being sort of like this happy-go-lucky, smiling, docile guy. And he was some of that, could be very pleasant, but he was tough as nails. Hank Aaron was tough as nails, okay? And he was a guy that was blasted as much when he was not playing baseball anymore as he was when he was playing baseball. That's the part that people miss. They want to, want to think, oh, that was all in the past, back in the 70s, you know, we had the death threats. No, 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 no. That continued. When he became the executive of the Braves, he caught holy hell from outside the Braves and inside the Braves. That's all in, that, in the book. Uh, little stuff, like for instance, uh, uh, he, he said that he had different people in, in the Braves front office that would insinuate he, that he was uh, inferior to them because he, he didn't know what he was doing and that, that it was racial overtones along those lines. Uh, he came back to, Ted Turner gave him an office at the CNN Center, a real nice office. And uh, he came back to the office one day and his name plate was taken off and they, they put him on with another person. It was like for him to share the office, okay? They didn't want him to have his own office. And then he went and complained about it to Ted Turner and he got put an end to that. Just little tiddly things, okay? Uh, he never got credit for that, that run when the Braves uh, won 14 consecutive division titles. Those players, the, the bulk of that, those players, those were Hank Aaron players. He was very resentful for that. Then, like I said, he would call me up. The biggest, one of the biggest persons he had a problem with, and how many Braves fans do we have in here? You might want to hold your ears. Uh, he did not like Bobby Cox. Bobby Cox is the manager of the Braves, okay? And this put me in a real tough dilemma because I got along with Bobby Cox as well as any reporter. Bobby Cox is interesting. He's not doing so well right now. Bob, but Bobby Cox, from a reporter standpoint, people liked him because he was friendly, but he, he never said anything. It was like cotton candy. He didn't, there's nothing there. Okay. It's like Tom Glavin gets shelled. It's like, well, he pitched good for me. Well, you know, yeah, right, Bobby. But they didn't know the secret to talk to Bobby. Bobby gave me an awful lot of stuff because the secret to talking to Bobby Cox was to know what time he got to the ballpark. Braves played at 7.30. What time do you think Bobby Cox got to the ballpark? 3.30. Turn. You're, well, that's way too late. Noon. Okay. And then he had his office, then he had his real office. His real office was the weather room. It was like this little closet. And, and, and when, when Bobby got to the, to the game, he would get dressed in his entire uniform, you know, and with a hat and spikes, which was insane. It was eight hours before the game. And he sat in that, that weather room just watching the, the radar screen for like hours. Okay, unless it was a NASCAR race. You like NASCAR too. So the NASCAR thing being on. So that's all part of the story. So Hank calls me out one day and he's fuming. This is like one of the masks I've ever heard. He's just, he's just out of his mind. And he said, did you see the Braves game? I said, no, I wasn't watching. And apparently there was a rain delay. And during the rain delay, somebody asked Bobby uh, about Chipper Jones. And so Bobby apparently mentioned how he got Chipper Jones to come to the Braves. And Hank took that personally because Hank is the guy that got Chipper Jones to the Braves. I'm just giving you the short version. So he said that, I want you to write about this. I need you, need you to write about this. I'm thinking, I'm on the other end of the like, oh gosh, <laughs> this is, ah. I said, oh, okay, um, hmm. So journalism, this is another thing that I loved about our relationship, relationship with Hank Aaron. We both understood our positions. Uh, I never took advantage of Hank. I, I always put in a book, I never looked at Hank as being a, an ATM machine. Okay, by just going to the, the bank too much, because I could find out anything from Hank, but I didn't want to overdo that. Okay, I'll tell you something about sources. You may have, just because the source is there, that means you don't have to just run them dry. Okay, uh, that's one thing. And Hank also understood my role as a journalist, which this story tells you about. So Hank, uh, so Hank's going on, he's like, you know, like a good solid 20 minutes, blah, blah, blah. I got the phone, I'm like, oh, <laughs> like this. So then when he finishes, I said, so Hank, you know I'm going to have to talk to Bobby Cox, get his side of the story. What, what, what am I trying to say here, students? Why, why do I have to talk to Bobby Cox? OK, be fair in what sense? Get both sides of the story. There you go, get both sides of the story. Hank said, yeah, OK, good, do it. I respect Hank for that. So I go, I go, I go to Bobby Cox, I'm all nervous, like, oh, geez, you know, here goes the relationship. I get there at noon, you know, Bobby, Bobby's sitting up there looking at the weather screen, you know, with his uniform on, his cap, smoking a cigar, you know, and I'm like, 
and usually I, I kind of play around with them because another teaching lesson when you're doing interviews, you know, you want to, you know, butter people up just a little bit. You don't want to hit them with the hard stuff. But this is so deep, I said, I'm just going to go straight for the chocolate. <laughs> I said, uh, Bobby, I got to tell you what Hank said. So I just told him about Hank and Chipper Jones. I'm thinking, how is he going to react? So Bobby swings around and looks at me, and he says, is he serious? Of course, he threw some other expletives in there, but since I'm a Sunday school teacher, I can't tell you what he said. Uh, <laughs> and I'm thinking, mm. so now, now I'm thinking he's going to say, well, this is off the record. I don't want to talk about it. But then he says, get out your notebook. Okay. It gives me about five minutes, but I like Hank, and blah, 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 and then he explains it. He says, is that enough? I said, yeah. He said, okay, good. That was it. That's, that's what I wrote, okay? Both sides. So I go back to Hank, and I told, told Hank, I said, Hank, this is what Bobby said. I just want to let you know what Bobby said. He said, good, write it. That tells you about Hank, okay? So the book is about that. The book is also about uh, Barry Bonds, okay? By the way, how much time I got? Because I could talk. How much more time? 20 minutes. 20 minutes? Okay, good, good. That's it. That's it. You always want to know mm, how much time you got to fill the space. So uh, Barry Bonds. You guys know who Barry Bonds is? Okay, Barry Bonds is the guy who broke Hank Aaron's uh, home run record, <laughs> theoretically. Okay, and uh, uh, back in August of 2007, okay, Barry Bonds broke, supposedly broke his record. And this was, this was interesting. And this is why I talk about fate and about how things uh, work out. Uh, on the one hand, I was a Hank Aaron whisperer, but I also easily could have been the Barry Bonds whisperer because I'm the only reporter that got along with Barry Bonds, okay? I only had one problem with Barry Bonds, which is in the book, but that gets too involved. But uh, most people hate Barry Bonds, okay? But I didn't have a problem with Barry Bonds. And uh, so a year or so before Barry breaks the record, Hank tells me that I'm going into deep silence. I, you're the only person I'm going to talk to about this record. And Hank got ripped to shreds. Not because I, I was the only person going to, going to talk to. He got ripped to shreds because whenever people wanted to talk to him about it, he didn't want to talk about it. So they took this as a sign that he disliked Barry Bonds. But what it did was it made me very, very popular. I mean, I was on ESPN like four or five times a day for like a year, almost literally. CNN, CBS, NBC to bring crews to my house, you know, and the neighbors were like wondering like maybe I was, you know, I don't know, I was going to say something else. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so, I mean, it made me very popular. Sports Illustrator called me up one day, and they couldn't get Hank, and they did a whole story on cover story, a cover story on Hank Aaron and Barry Bonds and have, talk, have me talk about what Hank Aaron is thinking. And so after these situations would take place, uh, Hank would call me up, and he'd be like, hey, I just saw you on ESPN. That was good. That was very good. <laughs> yeah, that's what I would have said. Okay, so this goes on for, for like a year or so. And I always got, got to say this. Hank Aaron, uh, he was proud of that record, but he wasn't obsessed with that record. He could care less about that record. He didn't care if anybody broke that record. As far as Barry Bonds is concerned, he didn't mind Barry Bonds as a player, okay? In the beginning, because, you know, the steroid things, for those of you who don't know, a lot of people were against Barry Bonds because the steroids. I'll get to that in a minute. So it's steroids. Hank Ch evolved later in his life where he, that did bother him. Not only Barry Bonds bothers, but for the most part, it didn't bother him. But, but Hank could not stand Barry Bonds, the person. Could not stand him. He, he was one of the few people besides Bobby Cox that he did not like. And, and a lot of that was because there were two different people, okay? Uh, Barry Bonds, is, I should say from a public standpoint, Barry Bonds, very arrogant guy, very unapproachable. And that kind of stuff, I got, my reason for that is people didn't really understand him because Barry Bonds was actually a shy guy, introverted, and, and this is, and I've learned this growing up, and perhaps some of you have learned the same thing. A lot of people who give you this big and bad stuff is a cover for something else. And I saw right through that from the very beginning. And Barry knew that I saw right through that. As a matter of fact, uh, part of your homework assignment, Google Terrence Moore, remember it's Terrence with one R, T-E-R-E-N-C-E, -E -E, Google Terrence Moore, Barry Bonds, and was going to pop up is a story that went viral. And it went viral because back in, uh, when he was, uh, after his playing career, he spent a year as a, as a hitting coach for the Florida Marlins. Uh, he pulled me aside and he says, I need to talk. We sat for an hour 
and he just bore his soul about how he screwed up his entire life by being a, I can't say the word. And then he just went on and on. And while he's talking to me, I was like, whoa, I can't believe he's saying this stuff. And at the end, it's like, you want me to write this? Said, yeah, write it. Google, you'll see what I'm saying. So there was that side of Barry Bonds, one that I understood. So, but anyway, another anecdote. This, this, this tells you uh, all you need about Barry and Hank. This is the fall of 2000, fall 2001. And Hank calls me up, and we're talking, and he says, yeah, I mean, they want me to do this commercial, but I'm not going to do it. I said, what commercial is that? I, said, ah, I don't want to talk about it. I said, oh, okay, that's fine. So then a few weeks go by, and Hank said, eh, I'm going to do the commercial. I said, oh, okay. I said, what's, what's the commercial? He said, well, I'll just say this. They want me to do it with the other guy. Who's the other guy? Yeah, other guy. He says, but they say that if we do it, I don't have to be in the same room, room with him at any time. So that's why I'm going to do it. I said, okay. Google this when you get a chance. Google Hank Aaron, Barry Bonds. This is one of the 10 greatest commercials ever, okay? It appeared during the 2002 Super Bowl. And, and it is very, very great commercial, 30 seconds. And now that I've told you what, you what you're doing, you're going to say, wow. They weren't, they weren't ever around each other at any point in this commercial. And I got the details in the book. So you got that side of them. The other side of, of Hank Aaron is the humorous side. The guy was just hilarious. Philanthropist, gave a lot, but he's also just hilarious. And one of my favorite Hank stories, just in general, and I wrote about this for Atlanta Journal Constitution, and, and this is also a teaching lesson for the students, is that, that you can get a lot of stuff by just observation. And I'm at the Atlanta airport, and I walk down to the Atlanta airport, and I see Hank Aaron walking down the, the concourse. And my normal inclination is I know Hank is to go up to him, hey, Hank, blah, blah, blah. But something just told me just to sit back and just watch. Okay? Why do you think I was going to sit back and watch? Anybody? Yeah. To see how others approached it. Very good. Very good. You know something about journalism. I like that. So I'm just like watching, you know, people going up. And, you know, when you're at the airport, I mean, unless you're, most people are in a hurry, particularly if you're Hank Aaron. Because he's got some place to go, I'm sure. And no matter who came up to him, Hank would stop and sit there and talk. It was Hank Aaron. You know, smiling and answering questions. And then you can see him hustling. And then somebody comes up to him again. He's stopping and smiling and hustling. So I, I wrote a whole column about this, about being Hank Aaron. One of my favorite columns I wrote for the Atlanta Journal Constitution, just, just watching him, watch people react to him. So anyway, <clears throat> it was like, uh, I'm telling Hank. I said, I said, Hank, I said that, uh, tell him about this story, you know. And Hank had this contagious laugh. And he's like laughing. I said, I said, what, I said, what, what are you thinking when... Uh, People come up to you like that, which they do all the time. And Hank's laughing. He says, let me tell you something. He says, sometimes they'll be around me, and, and, and people don't know that I can hear them. So he said, <laughs> he said, he says, one time I'm sitting there, and he said, and I hear somebody in the background say that, that's Hank Aaron. I thought he was dead. <laughs> and Hank just started laughing like crazy. So you, you had that, that side of them. But I want to wrap up before I open up the questions about how this book came about. And this is very interesting. Uh, and this is the first book that I've written. And, uh, and that's all part of the story. In the summer of 2020, I'm talking to Hank. And I said, I said Hank, out of all the books that have been written about you, there's been tons. Out of all the articles that have been written about you, out of all the... TV shows and documentaries and that kind of stuff. I said, people still don't know the real Hank Aaron. What's the name of the book? The Real Hank Aaron. I said, they don't know the real Hank Aaron. And he says, you know, you're right. And then he starts saying that, yeah, there's this, there's this. And he said, well, you know all about this. He said, and he says, you and I need to write a book. I said, yeah, I think we do. I said, let's do it. So summer of 2020, so I'm all giddy. I'm all happy. I'm writing this book on Hank Aaron. I got all this stuff that nobody knows about Hank Aaron, 95%. So the giddiness ends about two weeks after that. Hank calls and says, um, <clears throat> might have a problem here. I said, so what is it? He says, and this is one of the few times I could tell, tell Hank didn't want to talk about something. He says, oh, man, this must be really bad. He says, um, I need you to talk to Alan. And Alan is Alan Tannen, Tannenbaum, and that's Hank's lawyer. Been Hank's lawyer forever. I'm like, what did I do? <laughs> Am I going to get arrested or what? So uh, 
So I call up Alan. I say, hey, Alan, it's Terrence Bourne. I said, yeah. And he's like nervous. I'm like, why is he nervous? He's a lawyer. <laughs> he said, eh. It seems that uh, about a year or so ago, he said that uh, we were at this event and we're talking to uh, Doug Brinkley, Douglas Brinkley. Anybody know who Douglas Brinkley is? Who is he? Historian. historian. Presidential historian. You know, these huge biographies. And he said that we kind of made a, a gentleman's agreement that he would do this exclusive book with Hank. And the book would, uh, it would run in uh, 2025 to commemorate the uh, uh, 50th anniversary of, how did that work, 225, the math doesn't work out there. But it was the 50th anniversary of 715 and also the 50th, and it also would be corresponding with his 90th birthday. That would be next year. Yeah, 90th birthday. And uh, so he said that because of that, officially, uh, we can't have his people talk to you, blah, 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 that kind of stuff. So I'm thinking, oh, man, this is, this is bad. So there's a pause over the phone. And then he says, but this does not pre preclude you from writing a book. Because he says, you know more about Hank than anybody. I said, oh, okay, I do. <laughs> I can do that. And I did. I mean, I had all this stuff. I had all this material from stuff that only I know about with, with involving Hank, like the Bobby Cox stories and what have you and other stories. I had my personal stories with him. Then I had something else, okay? And this just tells you about, about fate, okay? And there's something else I tell my students is that don't throw anything away. One of the things that, thing that happens with us as reporters when we do interviews uh, certainly in the, in, the, in the era of cassette, tape recorders, and what have you, you do an interview, and then you immediately just erase over it and go on to the next. It's like Bill Belichick. Anybody know who Bill Bel Belichick is? Mm -hmm. It's like, on to Cincinnati. Okay, you know, you just be with it. Anyway, you, you, you'll get it in the morning sometime. Some of you will. <laughs> so you just erase over it. So it's like in the early 1990s, okay, and I just got through interviewing Hank Aaron. I'm getting ready to, like, delete. I'm, and, and I'm like, wait a minute. Why am I deleting this stuff? This is Hank Aaron talking. So you know where I'm going here. I got all these interviews with Hank Aaron that I've saved, okay? And right now, and this just tells you you don't know what, how the world's going to change. Web3, now, right now, so I got a company together. And matter of fact, you're the first group that's going to hear this. Uh, look for this sometime in the late summer, early fall. We've got sound bites, sort of like NFT type deals. They're going to come out for purchase where people can buy different sound bites. There's nothing scandalous, you know, that, that sort of thing. But just Hank Aaron in his own words talking about various things. It's cutting edge technology. So I, I got that, that that's coming out. So that's all good. Uh, when I was writing the book, never wrote a book before. And, and once the uh, publisher agreed to do the book, you know, it was very much like, uh, you know, when I was trying to dress Hank Aaron or, or ask Hank Aaron for the interview, it's like, you get it. And I was like, now, now what do I do? So when they said, yeah, yeah, we're going to write a book. So I was like, Oh, I never wrote a book before. <laughs> so then I said, I'm going to practice what I preach. I'm going to do what I teach my students, OK? And I, I'm very huge on fundamentals. You got to do the fundamentals. And I always tell them everything's the same. You know, whether you're playing sports, whether you're, whether you're teaching, whether you're driving a bus, everything's the same. You still got to get the fundamentals down. So we spent a whole lot of time with the fundamentals. Dr. Cauley came in the other day to talk to him about the fundamentals of grammar, because they needed it. And uh, so we get that down. And then one of the things I always say is that the big three things you got to do, okay? Reporting, interviewing, angles. Angles, reporting, interviewing. Interviewing, reporting, you got to do that. Even though my class is about feature writing, about, it's about editorial writing, writing your opinion, critical writing, no, nah, uh, no, no, it's not going to be that kind of party. You still got to do the reporting, the interviewing. What's the other one? Angles, got to have the right angle, all right? Then the big thing that every once in a while I have somebody to come up, point up, say, come to the board. I said, put those two words on the board. The two words are startle me. Startle me. What does that mean? Startle me. That should be your mindset. Every approach to writing, broadcasting, whatever, startle me. I'm not talking about sensationalism, okay? You still got to do the basics. You still got to have the interviewing, the reporting, the angles, the, the, the sourcing, all that kind of stuff. Startle me. In other words, make it interesting. People don't have enough a lot of time nowadays, okay? They got things to do. 
you know, if they get through your first paragraph, your first sentence, that's the other thing I talk about, the first is huge. Every, the first of everything is huge. The first paragraph, the first sentence, the first word. That's what, whatever you write. I mean, all that's important. You've got, you got to have it. You've got to have it and sell it on me. So it's like, well, I've got to do the same thing. So I'm thinking, like, what can I do? What can be the hook in this book? And I, and I start thinking, well, you know, I've got the big three, the symmetry. Yeah, that's good. But I need something else. I need a story. I, I, need, I need an anecdote. I need something that's going to carry through this book as a theme that I can build everything else around that. What do you think I chose? Hint, hint. You saw it already. The interview about how that came about. Everything that I just talked to you from walking through, throughout so my hook, throughout this entire book, every chapter is a snippet of everything I told you at the beginning of this interview about what took place. So what does that do if you're a reader? You want to keep reading, like, how's this going to end? Is he going to do this interview or not? Is he going to die? I mean, what's going to happen? So that's the beginning of every chapter. And then I got the sub-stories, the Barry Bonds, the, Bob, the Bobby Cox, the me, the, the terrorism I encountered in the Atlanta Constitution. Those are all, like, parts of it. Divinely inspired. Then we'll open up the questions. Uh, like I say, being a spiritual person, I think everything happens for a reason. This literally happened to me. It was like 4 o'clock in the morning, and this happens to me a lot with stories. And I think anybody else a writer can attest to this. And I got to the point where I, I keep like a notepad by my bed, because that's when I think of stories. I wake up and say, oh, that's an idea. <laughs> write it down. And I'm thinking of leads. I'm like writing, writing it down. So, so I wake up in the middle of the night, and I got the entire book in my head. It's like, oh, you know what? This is chapter one. This is chapter two, chapter three. I'm writing it down, chapter four. Three. And there were like nine chapters, okay? What, why is the number nine significant in baseball? Nine, nine innings. So I was like, oh, oh, this is pretty convenient. So, I had, so every chapter, I got first inning, second inning, third inning, right on, right on down the line. And, then, and then, then just the story, some of the story. Everything just fit in neat, neatly. I even had the the the, the uh, titles for each of the chapters. And for the most part, except for one or two cases, the, the titles that came up for each chapter that in the middle of the night, I still use. You know, I, I look at it and say, okay, do I want to change it? It's like, no, that's good. I need to change it. No, that was good. No, this is good. No, yeah, thank you. It's like manna from heaven. <laughs> so I finished writing the book. I got it all finished. And now I'm at the end of the book. And it's like, man, I got all this stuff that's left over. What can I do with this? What do, you think I, what, what do you think I did with it? All the leftover stuff. I said, I can use this. And what did I call that chapter? Extra innings. Extra innings. Ah, Extra innings. So that came about. I'm going to wrap it up this way, then we'll open up for questions. So the book comes out. The book's doing very well. Thank you very much. And so it's like August of last year, the book publisher, Triumph, called me up and said that, we love this book. Turned out real well. I said, do you have a book number two? Okay. And something else I always tell my students, always be prepared for a yes. Always be prepared. And I'll, I'll use some sports analogies. Like, uh, uh, I'll give you a short one here. Like I'm, I'm a big Vince Lombardi fan. Anybody know who Vince Lombardi was? V football coach for the Green Bay Packers in the 1960s. The Green Bay Packers won five world championships, the first two Super Bowls. And, and, and they ran one play, just one play. Power sweep, they ran to the left, they ran to the right. Nobody could stop it. Nobody could stop it. Why couldn't they stop it? I mean, you knew where they were going to run. They knew they were going to run. Nobody could stop it. They couldn't stop it because they executed well. Okay? But one of the big things that Lombardi used to say was, and you can Google this too, he said, we're going to have a seal here, we're going to have a seal there, and we want the running back to run up the middle and run the daylight. Okay? Students, when he says run the daylight, what, what was he talking about? Okay? Why didn't he say trot the daylight? Why didn't you say trot the daylight? What happened, what happened if you trot the daylight? Okay, and you probably get crushed, right? Okay, so how does that apply to life? Run the daylight. Like if you want something, you gotta go after it. There you go, because you got that opening, right? Because if you wait too long, what's gonna happen to that opening? That's exactly right. 
Okay? So, so that, that's the philosophy that I always had. So when they said that, you got book number two? I said, yeah. Did I have a book number two? No, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't have a book number two. But I got one. <laughs> okay. So I was like, what can I do? So the book I came up with, the title is Red Brick Magic, Sean McVay, John Harbaugh, Miami University's Cradle of Coaches. Miami University is famous for these great football coaches. We're the only school that's got two current NFL coaches, both won Super Bowls. John Harbaugh of the Baltimore Ravens, uh, Sean McVay of the LA Rams. Greatest coaches of all time, went to Miami, Ohio. Paul Brown, they invented two NFL teams. Uh, we got Bo Schembechler, the greatest coach in the history of Michigan. Woody Hayes, greatest coach in the history of Ohio State. The guy that invented the 3-4 defense went to Miami, Ohio. Um, the first black executive in the history of professional sports, Wayne Embry, Miami of Ohio. It just goes on and on and on and on and on. And, uh, and, but the newspaper was Sean McVay. Because Sean McVay, 36 years old, had just won the Super Bowl. Okay, that kind of stuff. So I called the next day. Why did I call the next day and then wait till a week later or two weeks later? Why did I call the next day? The book publisher. There you go. There you go. Okay, very good. I think you guys are smart students. Okay. I said, hey, I got this idea, blah, blah, blah. They said, oh, that sounds great. I said, well, we'll, we'll get back to you. They called me the next day. I said, yeah, um, we, want the, we want to publish that in August of 2023. I'm like, what the? I don't know if anybody's written a book before, but it's like, mm, that's kind of quick. But what do you think I said? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's fine. Mm. And I said, well, what do you need? And I said, okay, well, this is what we need. We need 75% of it by uh, January 1st. We need the rest of it two weeks at the end of the Super Bowl. Can you do that? What do you think I said? Yeah, yeah I can do that. Okay. Well, I'm proud to announce the book is done. Okay, it is done. I don't know how good it is. No, actually, it's, it's pretty good. Uh, so the book is done, and it's going there. What I learned from the first book, I'm a very organized person. That's one thing I pride myself in is being organized. But as organized as I thought I was, I wasn't organized. And, and so what I did differently this book was, I made sure that I got all the reporting out of the way and interviewing out of the way, the bulk of it, in the first couple of months or so, and then I did the writing, okay? You still got to do interviewing and reporting along the way, but I did the heavy listening beforehand. Before, I kind of was doing, you know, it all at the same time, which worked, but it wasn't as efficient. So that's the one tidbit I give everybody if you think about writing a book. Now with that, let's open it up for any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Yes, when you were telling the story about <clears throat> the San Francisco paper and doing that investigative series about that lie in the baseball roster about race, and you talked to reach out to Hank Aaron. So what happened at that point when you reached out to him? Oh, Hank Aaron substantiated everything I said. He, he said the same thing that, uh, that the other guys were saying. But I'm glad you asked that because I left something out, out that's very important. That's very, and again. Teaching lesson. Okay, pay you guys listen to this? Very, this is very key. So, if I've got all this stuff and people accusing people of racism in baseball, I mean, this is pretty heavy stuff. Systematically phasing out African Americans, quota system. Who is the ultimate person I need to talk to? The commissioner of baseball. Okay. Bowie Coon was the commissioner of baseball at the time. So I got to have a strategy. Okay, Evan's not here, but you know, we'll point it. Evan, what do I got to have? But anyway, Evan will say, a strategy, you know, Mr. Moore or Terrence or TM, whatever. You got to have a strategy. So, I, so before I call the commissioner, I said, okay, I got to have a, have a strategy. So I came up with a strategy, and it, it worked. It worked. So I called Bowie Coon, called his office, and, and it was very similar to the Hank Aaron story. I called up, I said, hey, uh, can you connect, connect with Commissioner Coon's office? And I said, uh, Terrence Moore, San Francisco Examiner, I need to talk to him about uh, blacks in baseball. I got some very disturbing uh, news, reporting that I've done. So, well, the commissioner's busy, blah, blah, blah. So I said, okay. I said, well, I really need his side of the story because we're running a series of San Francisco Examiner, and I just want to make sure that he's not blindsided by this, okay? Why did I do it that way? You think it's going to return my phone call with that? Okay. He returned the phone call. <laughs> okay. Because even then, baseball was very conscious of his image. All right. So I get a call from his, his uh, secretary. Said, oh, can you hold the line for Commissioner Kuhn? So yeah, sure. All right. So he picks up the phone. And I had met him one time before 
the year before it came to Candlestick Park, and it was very difficult to not remember me because there were only two black guys covering Major League Baseball in 1982. So he's like, oh, yeah. He says, yeah. how are the Giants? Pretty, pretty good. Oh, yeah, yeah. So this is when I did play the game. Yeah, yeah. We were talking back and forth. Back and forth. So I said, uh, Commissioner, so I got something very important to ask you. I said that, is Major League Baseball phasing out African Americans? What do you think he said? Oh, of course. That's preposterous. I can't believe you said anything. There's no way. Man. We love Jackie Robinson. You know, they always go back. Oh, we're, we're Jackie Robinson. Okay. Willie Mays. Blah, blah, blah. I'm just like, listen. I said, okay. I said, so, uh, it's so all part of my game plan. I said, okay. I said, so let me ask you another question. I said, is there anything that would indicate that Major League Baseball is phasing out African Americans? Oh, no, there's nothing. Boy Coon was a lawyer. He caught himself. He said, uh, not that I know of. <laughs> I said, oh, okay. I said, I'm, I'm going to send you something. I can tell you he's getting nervous over the phone. So back in those days, you had faxes. So I, so I faxed him the scouting report. All hell broke loose. There were 26 major league teams at the time. They sent a memo to all 26 major league teams to stop the practice immediately. They didn't. It was all part of another part of the story. But I just want you to, get, to hear that to understand what you can do, you know, that get to, 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 uh, to the top as much as you can and just see what you can get. Yeah. So obviously you're friends with Hank Aaron. How do you keep your professional and your personal separated? And you don't want to share personal secrets or conversations. How do you keep those two things separate? That's a, that's a very good question. And, you know, and I'm going to answer that broadly. Like when, when, I, when I do stuff like this, one of the questions I get is, like, what's the toughest part of your job? And it's easy. And the toughest part of being a journalist, I think anybody can attest to this, is you want to be close enough to people where they trust you, but you don't want to be close enough where they think you're friends with them. That's tough, okay? And the thing that I was fortunate with, Hank always understood that relationship, okay? And uh, it was a unique thing. It really was. I mean, it was a friendship, but it still was a professional thing. Uh, it was tough. And when I wrote this book, I mean, was, uh, there's some other stuff that I know that I could have put in the book. Yeah, okay. But this is not a scandalous book. I mean, it, it's, it's a tough book, but I didn't want to write this, anything along those lines. Because here's the other thing, too, is that, like my Aunt Flossie used to say, you ain't got to tell everything, okay? <laughs> because what you do is sometimes you hurt future sourcing. One of the things I think that most journalists will tell you, we know everything. We really do. I mean, I don't care, sports writing, uh, news guy, we know everything. These people in the, 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 the White House correspondents, you know, they're not writing everything. They're not saying everything they know. <laughs> they know everything. We only write or say maybe 40% of what we know. The people will say, well, that doesn't sound like it's fair. Well, let me tell you why. It's because part of what I'm saying here with the sourcing thing, part of it is you got to, well, first of all, you got to make sure that just because somebody says something, you can't just run with it. I'm old school journalist. That's kind of being not done nowadays, but theoretically, you're not to run it. And second of all, you want to make sure that's not going to affect you down the line. For instance, if I write everything that I know about Hank Aaron in this book, okay, and other people that I have good relationships with, they're reading this, what are they going to say? If he's writing that about him, I mean, what might he say about me? So I'm not going to talk to him the way I usually talk to him. So I'm going to run away to answer your question. Yeah. Hi. Um, hi, Dr. Moore. It's an honor to meet you. Yeah. Um, I just had a question about the story that you wrote with the San Francisco Inquirer. I remember you telling a story about meeting with a scout, and it was a lot like Watergate deep throat with your smoking gun, and like how it was very secretive. I just wanted to know, how, like, how do you approach more people to talk to, such about like a high-pressure case? Like, who else could you talk to, and how do you get people to come forward with information in their opinion? It's so like, high-pressure. That's a very good question. As a matter of fact, when, when, I, when the examiner, uh, Charles Cooper, who was a sports editor, told me to take the time off from the Giants and do it, he warned me. He said, this is going to be tough. He says, you're going to get a lot of pushback from this, and, and I hope you're prepared for it. And I said, hey, I got, I got a father who told me a story about November 26, 63, so I'm, I'm ready for this. I had a football coach who used the N-word right in front. So, no, I was prepared for that. But, you know, and I've got, I got to be quite honest with you with this, and this, got, this was miraculous. 
as touchy as that subject was, it was about 1982, 40 years ago, it's remarkable how little resistance I got. That's why I say everything's on the record. Everything's on the record. I mean, I, I, had, I had a few people who pushed back, you know, in a real ugly way. Not a lot, okay? And, 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 I, and I look back and I think the reason that I didn't get as much pushback from that as you would normally think is because they knew that there was <laughs> something bad going on. As we see today in 2023 with the numbers like less than 7%. Uh-huh. Yes. Nice to meet you. Oh, thank you. Um, like, going back to you talking about you know, the skills, the ethics of life, like, you know, everything has a purpose, you have faith. Uh, with the adversity she fought throughout racism through your whole life, have, was there, like, a point where you wanted to, like, give up with that or, you know, keep it moving or whatever the case is with that? Like, would you, ever, like, ever feel like this wasn't for you or anything? Yeah, you know, you, you, have, you have your moments, and uh, uh, particularly at the Land Journal Constitution, because I'm telling you, it was, it was ugly. And if I ha have more time, I've done this in, in other sessions, I've got, well, put it, put it this way. The, the IT people at, at the Land Drone Constitution said that I got something like 10 or 15 time more, times more feedback than anybody on the paper. And it was not good, okay? And it would be like in the old days, we had this system where you had voicemails, where people can call up and complain, stuff like that. And I would have to call up my voicemail about every hour and a half or so to delete because it was just full of just, you know, <laughs> you're gonna beep, you're gonna beep, you're gonna, just all the way through, just constantly like that, okay? And, uh, and I was also tipped off, this is not in the book, but I also tipped off, and I was very fortunate, I did have some people on the inside of the paper that would tell me different things, that there were even people on the paper they were doing that to try to get to discourage me, to try to get push me away. So, and I will not tell no lie to say that that was not a difficult time, because if you're if you're listening to that, and you don't know where this is coming from, and you you, I mean, it's just it's just very very difficult, and and, and that's why it's so important to have. For me, I had supportive parents, obviously, because of what they went through. I had Hank Aaron, and then spiritually, that helped, also helped me too get get through, get through it. But it's tough. But the one thing that kept running through my head, and again, I talk about the parents, is that uh, getting in the fetal position, and feeling sorry for myself, was not an option. Because my parents didn't do it. They didn't do it. Then I'm, I'm just talking about my parents, but I go further than that. My, uh, and this is a book, future, future book I want to do. My, uh, one of the most fascinating pers persons I ever met in my life was my great-grandfather. This, this was my mom's uh, grandfather. He was, he, he was the oldest person in the United States when he died. This is 1965. He lived to be, how old do you think he was? Pretty close, 111 years old. Oh, wow. South Bend, Indiana. He died when I was 10 years old, very coherent. He used to tell these stories about being a water boy in the Civil War back in Cotton Plant, Mississippi. That's where my mom's side of the family is. Okay, another guy that prepared us for stuff. And, and the thing is, at family reunions, they put me in charge of the family reunion because everybody's afraid of me, but anyway. Uh, and uh, and I, one of the things they do is I, they have me tell stories. Yeah, I mean, believe, can you believe have me telling a story? Anyway, so they would have me tell stories about Grandpa Graham because I'm the one that remembers these things because I've always had this fascination with younger people, which is why I'm teaching at Georgia State, and older people. And I, and I, I, mean, I was just sitting there and listening to him where everybody else, when he started talking, it's like, oh, that old guy is talking. This guy was fascinating. You know, I'm 10 years old. He used to wear a suit every single day. Every single day. He carried it along in a satchel. And in the satchel, he had an apple, no, he had an onion and a Bible. Okay? The Bible, you can probably figure out why. The onion, nobody has no, any idea why he had the onion in there. Uh, but anyway, he was another one that prepared us, telling us these stories. And be, beyond him, uh, my mom and dad each had uh, nine brothers and sisters when they were all living. And they all lived in South Bend, Indiana. Uh, both my grandparents lived in South Bend, Indiana. But they all came up during the Great Migration. You guys know about the Great Migration from the South. And like my mom's side of the family from Cotton Plant, uh, Mississippi, my dad's side of the family from Dale, Arkansas. And I mention that because all these grandparents and aunts and uncles, and by the way, I, for you young folks, let me tell you something. Family reunions. One of the things that, that, that I do at the family reunions 
I play these videos of some of the older people that way back when, 20, 30 years ago, that I had the omniscience to record and have them talking about the past. I got them, okay? And I would just bring out different things. I didn't know that. Oh, you got Aunt Inez saying this, blah, 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 you know, growing up. And that all helped me and helped us become who we are. So when we face this adversity, we know that, hey, these people have been able to, they, our ancestors, they dealt with this before in a different form, but we can deal with the same thing. And I will say this, one of the things I'm proud of in this book, the people read it, it is a how-to book on how to battle modern racism. Is this not a book about Hank Aaron? Bobby? It's, I wanted to make it a, a, a instructive book because the modern racism nowadays is not fire hoses or attack dogs, it's mind games. Okay, it's mind games. That's what Hank went through at the Atlanta, at the, at the Atlanta Braves. I said Atlanta Journal Constitution because to me it was the same thing. <laughs> Braves and the Journal Constitution. Hank went through the mind games when he was an executive with the Braves. I went through the mind games, games at the Atlanta Journal Constitution. And other black folks can tell you about the same thing about mind games. And the key to surviving a life, even beyond just black and white, no matter who you are, when you have people playing mind games with you, the key is how do you respond? How do you react? And how not to react. But I look at it as positive. How to react on the positive, okay? Because there's a way you can act on, a, on the positive and get through it, survive, and advance. Pass it. Uh-huh. Like, I remember, like, you was mentioning they were bare monsters, talking about, like, how you, like, saw right through like, how, uh, on the outside, he has, like, he's this arrogant big talk guy, but inside, he's, like, shows to, like, shots and stuff. Like, so, how would you, how would you tell us, like, his, y'all, y'all, this is, is, like, would you consider him, like, like, one of your close friends? Or, if so, why, or why, why not? Well, I mean, I wouldn't call him friends. I wasn't as close to him as I was with Hank Aaron. But he's one of those type of guys that opens up to me more than anybody else, okay? And again, I'm going to make this a teaching lesson too. Developing sources. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, we talked a little bit about this in my class a few weeks ago. We'll talk more about it. But I'll give you the short version. I'm going to use Barry Bonds as an example. One of the best ways to develop sources is to have people feel comfortable with you, okay? But this is very difficult. Because let's go back to the question we had before about not making sure that they're friends with you, okay? You want to be close, but not, not friends, so to speak. And get them early and just kind of develop that relationship. I was very fortunate because when Barry Bonds came to the Pirates in 1986, that was his rookie year. Nobody knew Barry Bonds from Adam as far as how great it's going to be. And I just started talking to him just in general and, uh, you know, just uh, chit-chat and, and what have you. And uh, he felt comfortable with me. So there, there was just this comfortable feel. But at the same time, I didn't give him the impression that I'm giving him any kind of a break, which brings me to another story. 2007, August 2007, that's when Barry breaks the, the uh, uh, Hank Aaron's record theoretically. The early part of that year, the Braves are playing in San Francisco. Barry in the, in the, club, in the Giants clubhouse had the, the section of the clubhouse that people call Barry's world. Nobody was allowed over there unless Barry invited you there. He had a big screen television, reclining chair, Teammates hated him, <laughs> coaches hated him. He was out in his own little world. So, but nobody went over there, and, he, and particularly reporters, because you know, reporters weren't allowed. So, the playing, the playing the Braves, so I walk into the clubhouse, and Barry sees me, and he always calls me T. He says, hey, T, come over here. So I'm going over to Barry's world, and all these other reporters are looking like, wow, how do you get that, that special secret there? Is that a black thing, or you know what? So, so I, I, I go over to Barry, and Barry's chit-chatting and everything, Remember now, this is in the spring, right before he's going to break the record. We're talking back and forth, and I can tell that this is not what Barry wanted to talk about. Because Barry's not a chit-chat guy. He's got a point. So then he says, I need to ask you a question. He says, I've been watching you on ESPN. He says, you've been blasting me, which I did. <laughs> you've been blasting me. And he says, I just, I just want to say something. And he's got kind of watery eyes. I'm telling you, he's more sensitive than people think. He says, I, I just want to say something. From a black man to a black man, if, if, if I was in your shoes, you were in my shoes, I would not be blasting you like you've been blasting me as a black man to a black man. I'm just sitting there listening to him. I said, Barry, let me ask you a question. 
Name me one thing that I've been saying that's not true. I said, are you using steroids? <laughs> Bernie says, oh, you got me on that. <laughs> okay. So in other words, he admitted to me that he took steroids. Did I ever write that? I never wrote that. Why didn't I write that? You'd never be able to get anything from the men versus women. I could write that. I mean, and it's like, you can debate it. Some people say, well, you should have wrote it. Uh, no, I, I, the reason I decided against it because it wasn't a type of thing where he, he wanted me to write it, okay? Even though I know what he said. So that's just the way I operate. Because, and, that, and that allows me to, to keep the interview going with, with him later on. So the second part of that is, tells you about the hurt part of Barry. So Barry says, he says, I need to ask another question. He says, why doesn't Hank ever call me? Why doesn't Hank ever call me? Why were you asked? I said, Barry, why does Hank have to call you? Why don't you call Hank? Here's his number right here. He said, oh, he should be calling me. I said, no, 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 you got it backwards, man. You need to call Hank if you want to talk to him. So that's, that's the kind of relationship I have with Barry Bonds, okay? And it also just tells you about how we should be thinking about these type of relationships. And then, are we closing here? We're getting ready to. Okay. But I got time for another little story? Okay. Anyway. I, I got to throw the story in here because this just tells you about how you never know how you're walking that thin line between being a reporter and being a, uh, a friend of somebody, even if you think you're supposed to be a reporter. This goes back to when I'm covering the Oakland Raiders. I used to cover the Oakland Raiders. Uh, like I said, I was the first black person ever to cover a national fo football league team for a major metropolitan newspaper. And these were the real Oakland Raiders, not the clowns they have now. I don't know who these people are. But this was the Oakland Raiders in the early 80s that had the, all the Hall of Famers and what have you, that kind of stuff. So I had various sources on the team, and one of my top sources was the right tackle named Henry Lawrence, okay? His nickname was Killer, so keep that in mind. Uh, <laughs> and I got all kinds of stuff from, from Henry, you know, good inside stuff, you know, that kind of stuff. So it's January of 1982. The Oakland Raiders had moved to L.A., and back then, they played in the L.A. Coliseum from a reporter standpoint, was, which was, was one of the worst places to cover a game on deadline because the press box, the old time, the press box was at the top of the stadium. And, at the, and, and to get down to the locker rooms, you had to literally go through the crowd. Okay? Does anybody know how big the L.A. Coliseum is? 100,000. 100, so you got to go through all these people to get down to the field and then, because, you know, right at the 50-yard line, and then, go across the field, and the locker rooms were in this one little section over here, and then interview them in the locker room, and then reverse the process to go all the way back up there. Right. So uh, not, not good for a deadline. So they're playing the uh, New York Jets playoff game, and I, and I did this big story before the game about one of the biggest matchups is going to be between Henry, Henry Lawrence, the right tackle of the Oakland Raiders, and Mark Gastineau, who was a defensive end for the New York Jets. And Mark Gasso was this big talker, you know, and, and boasting and all kind of stuff. And uh, so anyway, the game takes place. Raiders lose. And uh, uh, who was the quarterback back then? Mark Wilson was the quarterback. Mark Wilson gets sacked like 10,000 times. And, uh, and, the, and, and Mark Gasso had, had this huge game. So this taught me a, a couple of things. But I'll get to that in a minute. Had this huge game, blah, blah, blah. So, but I'm just worried about the big picture. So I'm good. I'm right on deadline. It was a Saturday. The big paper for the San Francisco Examiner is the next day. So you don't have a lot, a lot of time to play around with. So I'm feeling good about myself. I mean, I've got this store out of the way. I can go out hang out in L.A., you know, write it. Phone rings. It's the office. They said, hey, listen, um, since you made a, such a big deal about that Gastineau, Henry Lawrence thing, we need you to, to do a sidebar on that. You guys know what a sidebar is? It's like a second story. Like a little story. Like, oh, man. First of all, I want to go out of town in L.A. And second of all, I just can't run up on them stairs. So I got to go all the way back down to get to the locker room. And now I'm thinking to myself, there may not be anybody in there anyway, or, you know, it's kind of near the end. So, you know, go down. And uh, I was a lot younger back then, so, you know, I can do it a little bit better than I can do it now. So I, I get into the Raiders locker room, and, you know, they're crushed. And Henry Lawrence, killer Henry Lawrence, sitting at his locker, you know, got his head down and, you know, looking down at the floor. Henry Lawrence was the most talkative guy on the team, except for this day. The only time in the history of Henry Lawrence's life he does not want to talk. Okay, 
And I said, Henry, can you just give me something about that? I don't want to talk, man. Okay. So I go over to the Jets locker room. Mark Gastineau talking his hell off. Okay. So I go back upstairs, reverse the process. I'm banging out this, this story because they wanted like 45 minutes. So I'm banging it out. And my lead was something like uh, uh, Mark, New York Jets defensive end Mark Gastineau was a boogeyman to Raiders right tackle Henry Lawrence for the entire game. And it just went, went from there, blah, blah, blah. I was pretty proud of myself. I thought it was pretty good. So I uh, wrote it January of uh, 1982. It's June of that year. I'm in the office of San Francisco Examiner. Phone rings. Pick up the phone. And in those days, there's this long distance haze. We can tell when it's long distance. You guys don't know anything about this, but in the old days, you can tell when it's long distance. So I'm hearing that. I said, hello. He said, I shouldn't even be talking to you. I said, who is this? Henry. I said, oh. I said, where, where are you, Henry? I'm home. He, he was from Palmetto, Florida. And, and, and so he just goes on. He's talking about how hurt he was. He said, I thought we were friends. You stabbed me in the back, man. You stabbed me in the back. I'm like, what in the world is he talking about? And one thing, when you're a writer, you may say your, your life flashes before you. Everything you've written about somebody flashes before you. I said, oh, God. He's mad about that. <laughs> yeah. So what is he mad about? And then he's going on, and then, then he, he hangs down the phone. I'm like, wow, that's pretty deep. I didn't know we were like that. <laughs> you know? And so a few weeks later, minicamp starts for the Raiders. So I go to minicamp. And I walk into the building, and Sam Bedrosian was the offensive line coach who I had a pretty good relationship with. And he got his hands and said, what were you thinking? So what are you talking about? He said, that, he used another word, that you wrote. I, I said, what? I said, Sam, you got to help me here. He said, that wasn't Henry's fault. He said, it was this, that, here. And what I learned about, about you know, not that you guys will write NFL someday, or cop, cop, or football in general. When it comes to offensive line play, there's so many factors that go into why something happens. And a lot of times, it's not the lineman's fault, OK? So there was something else that was going on there. And I, was so, I said, well, Sam, there wasn't anybody there that I can talk to. And Harry didn't want to talk. And again, people don't care about that. They just, but you just, I don't blame Henry for not talking to you. I said, oh, man, that's ridiculous. So Henry Lawrence did not talk to me for 30 years. Whatever the math is. Then, 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 I mean, I never talked. So one day, this is about four years ago, there's a story that I wanted to do about all these Oakland Raider players that are dying. And they are dying and I go, from that, that era for various reasons, okay? Just, it's just amazing how many of these guys are dead. And so then I said, you know, I wonder how Henry Lawrence is doing. And it's like 35 years. I said, what if he's calmed down? <laughs> so I said, I'm going to take a chance. So uh, I had this old telephone number, you know, you don't throw anything away. 35 years, still, it still worked. So I come and say, hey, Henry, um, you probably don't remember me. Terrence Moore says, yeah, I remember you. <laughs> I said, how's it going, Henry? He said, well, not so good. So he just goes on and just tells me about uh, all these aches and pains he's had. It was a great story, not for him. He was telling me about how he's been to the hospital like 25 times in the last year because of various ailments. He almost died about five or six times. It turned out to be a pretty good little story, you know. And uh, so uh, then he said, but yeah, he said, but you know, we, those were some good tight days, weren't they? We were reminiscing. So I'm thinking in the back of my head, I'm glad he finally got over that, <laughs> okay? And then, <laughs> you know where this is going. So then I'm asking a question, there's a pause. He says, I still haven't forgotten. <laughs> I still haven't forgotten. So I'm thinking, is he kidding me? I said, so I'm trying to change the subject. I said, so uh, how's your wife? He says, I still haven't forgotten. <laughs> Man, you stabbed me in the back. It's like 30 some years later. So the moral of the story is you just don't know. You know that line, I gotta tell people, you wanna be close up where you, you trust them, they trust you, but not friendly. Just don't know. Yeah. Uh -huh. Brian Greffel, like you're taking time to talk to this Brian. Oh, no problem. So my question, I also remember when that team, when the coach, it's so like let go, let's go out there and get these niggers like that. Coach. So right. how is that? Uh, so my question is, how has things been since? I'm sorry, not just that, with that coach, but also the the two players that refused to play because they refused to run out there because the coach let that word slip out of his mouth. Like how has been ever since? I'm talking about with that coach and and those two players. Well, the the, the, co the coach is dead. Matter of fact, I wrote about the incident that's in the book. Yeah, the coach the coach died about maybe 15 years ago. His name was Dick Krieger. 
And, and by the way, Dick Krieger, first job as head coach, University of Georgia. I'm just saying. Anyway, back in the 60s. So, uh, and then the two players, I mentioned, I didn't mention their names, but I mentioned that, that, that incident happened in the book. I haven't talked to them in about maybe about 20 years. And they were still talking about that incident, about how that affected them as two young white guys hearing that. But the thing that's interesting, they're the only ones. I mean, out of all the people on that team, players, coaches, support staff, you know, as far as the trainers, I have not heard a word from anybody else saying that, which tells you about racism, okay? People have got to stand up, and they told you about those two people that had the courage enough to say something, as opposed to all the ones that didn't. 